right to self-organization. The right to self-organization is the entitlement given to all employees to form, join, or assist in the formation of associations for purposes not contrary to law. The right to self-organization is guaranteed by the Constitution, specifically Section 8, Article 3, and Section 3, Article 13 of the 1987 Constitution, which read as follows. Section 8, Article 3. The right of the people, including those employed in the public and private sectors, to form unions, associations, or societies for purposes not contrary to law, shall not be abridged. Section 3, Article 13. It shall guarantee the rights of all workers to self-organization, collective bargaining and negotiations, and peaceful concerted activities, including the right to strike in accordance with law. The Labor Code of the Philippines, specifically Article 253, in turn states, All persons employed in commercial, industrial, and agricultural enterprises, and in religious, charitable, medical, or educational institutions, whether operating for profit or not, shall have the right to self-organization and to form, join or assist labor organizations of their own choosing for purposes of collective bargaining. There are two basic types of organizations that may be formed by employees. Number one, workers' association. And number two, labor organization. A workers' association is an organization of employees created for mutual aid and protection of its members or for any other legitimate purpose other than collective bargaining. A labor organization, which is commonly known as a labor union, is an association of employees created for collective bargaining or dealing with employers concerning terms and conditions of employment. Who can form or join a workers' association? All kinds of employees, whether managerial, supervisory, or rank and file, who are working in any type of establishment, operating for profit or not, can form or join a workers' association. Who can form or join a labor organization? Number one, supervisory employees. And number two, rank and file employees. These employees could be employed in any kind of establishment, whether commercial, industrial, agricultural, religious, charitable, medical, and educational institutions operating for profit or not. Therefore, employees of non-profit institutions can form a labor organization and bargain collectively with their employer. Who are considered as rank and file employees? Those who are neither managerial nor supervisory. Who are considered as supervisory employees? Those who, in the interest of the employer, effectively recommend managerial actions such as laying down and execution of management policies or the hiring, transfer, suspension, layoff, recall, discharge, assignment, or discipline of employees using their independent judgment. The supervisory status of an employee is determined not by the position title, but by the nature of the employee's functions. The point to consider is whether the employee has the power to effectively recommend the laying down and execution of management policies, including personal movement, using his independent judgment. If the power is merely routinary or clerical in nature, the position is not supervisory. Thus, the mere designation of an employee as chief mechanic, chief welder, or chief carpenter is not necessarily indicative of supervisory status. Such designation merely connotes that he is the number one mechanic, welder, or carpenter among the many of the same category. There is neither effective recommendation nor independent judgment if the power to hire and fire is subject to evaluation, review, and final action by the department heads and other higher executives of the company. Home workers or those employees who perform industrial work in their respective homes for the benefit of persons who deliver to them the goods to be processed or fabricated into a finished product can form or join a labor organization. Security guards can form or join a labor organization. Alien employees can form or join a labor organization, number one, if they have valid alien employment permits, and number two, if their country grants the same or similar rights to Filipino workers as certified by the Department of Foreign Affairs, or if their country has ratified either ILO Convention Numbers 87 or 98. Remember that supervisors and rank and file cannot lump into a single union. They should form their own separate organization. The reason for the segregation is the difference in their interests. In the area of collective bargaining, their interests are not identical 
because the needs of one are different from those of the other. In disciplinary matters, supervisors act contrary to the interests of the rank and file whenever they ask for the discipline or dismissal of subordinates. If supervisors and rank and file employees are allowed to form a single union, their conflicting interests will impair their relationship and adversely affect discipline because the supervisors might refuse to carry out disciplinary measures against their co-member rank and file employees. However, the supervisory union and rank and file union can join the same federation. While supervisory employees cannot join the union of rank and file employees, the union of supervisors and the union of rank and file employees can validly affiliate with the same federation or national union. For disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization. Number one, managerial employees. Number two, confidential employees who have access to labor relations matters. Number three, employees members of cooperatives. Number four, government employees. Number five, employees of GOCCs. And number six, workers who are intermittent, itinerant, or without definite employers. Were considered as managerial employees. Those vested with powers or prerogatives to lay down and execute management policies and or hire, transfer, suspend, lay off, recall, discharge, assign, or discipline employees. The managerial status of an employee is determined not by the nomenclature or title of the job, but by the nature of the employee's functions. The point to consider is whether the employee possesses authority to act in the interest of his employer on his independent judgment. The mere fact that an employee is designated as manager does not ipso facto make him one. The designation should be reconciled with the actual job description of the employee, for it is the job description that determines the nature of employment. What is the reason for the disqualification? It is the evident conflict of interest brought about by the nature of their position. In the field of collective bargaining, managerial employees are supposed to be on the side of the employer. They act as its representatives to ensure that its interests are well protected. The employer is not assured of such protection if these employees themselves are union members. In such a situation, collective bargaining can become one-sided. If managerial employees are allowed to form or join a union, the employer might not be assured of their loyalty. Moreover, the union can also become company-dominated with the presence of managerial employees. Confidential employees Not all confidential employees are disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization. The determining factor is not the existence of a confidential relationship per se, but the element of trust or confidence in connection with matters concerning the employer's labor relations. Employees who have access to information which is confidential from the business standpoint, such as financial information, marketing strategies, secret formula, or technical trade secrets are not disqualified from forming or joining a labor union. Were considered as confidential employees for purposes of disqualification. Only those who have access to labor relations information are disqualified. These are employees who act or assist persons who formulate, determine, and effectuate management policies in the field of labor relations. Therefore, to be disqualified, the confidential relationship must pertain to labor relations. Examples of confidential employees who have access to labor relations matters are legal secretaries, executive secretaries, and employees of the Human Resources Department like personal records clerk or labor relations personnel. What is the legal basis for the disqualification? It is the doctrine of necessary implication, which states that what is implied in a statute is as much a part thereof as that which is expressed. Applying this doctrine, the disqualification accorded to managerial employees equally applies to confidential employees because in the normal course of their duties, they become aware of management policies relating to labor relations. What is the reason for their disqualification? It is the potential conflict of interest. If Confidential employees who have access to labor relations information are allowed to unionize, they could be governed by their own motives rather than the interest of the employers. During collective bargaining, they might jeopardize the interest which they are duty-bound to protect. They may become a source of undue advantage because they may act as spies of either party. 
employees, members of cooperatives. To fall within the disqualification, the employee must at the same time be a member of the cooperative. The disqualification does not extend to employees who are not members of the cooperative. What is the reason for the disqualification? This is because the members are co-owners of the cooperative. Since they are co-owners, they cannot bargain with themselves. Government employees. Government employees refer to those employed by the national government, local government units, and government-owned and controlled corporations. What is the reason for their disqualification? Government employees are disqualified from forming a labor union because the terms and conditions of their employment are fixed by law. Such being the case, only Congress can prescribe or improve the terms and conditions of their employment. Can employees of GOCCs with special charter form or join a labor organization? The answer is no, because they are governed by the civil service law. On the other hand, can employees of GOCCs organized under the corporation law form or join a labor organization? The answer is no, because Article 254 of the Labor Code of the Philippines, which granted employees of government corporations established under the corporation code the right to organize and to bargain collectively with their respective employers, has been repealed by the GOCC Governance Act of 2011. With the enactment of the GOCC Governance Act of 2011, employees of GOCCs established under the corporation law can no longer form or join a labor union. Hence, they cannot bargain collectively. The reason is that the GOCC Governance Act of 2011 has provided a compensation and position classification system which applies to all GOCCs, chartered or non-chartered. Section 9 of the GOCC Governance Act of 2011 ordains that no GOCC shall be exempt from the coverage of the compensation and position classification system. Therefore, for purposes of disqualification from forming a labor union, the term GOCCs refers to both chartered and non-chartered corporations. The GOCC Governance Act of 2011 has removed the distinction between chartered and non-chartered GOCCs insofar as the right to form or join a labor organization is concerned. Take note that what has been withheld from employees of GOCCs organized under the corporation law is the right to seek better terms and conditions of employment through collective bargaining. Other rights and benefits under the Labor Code of the Philippines continue to be applicable, such as the right to retirement pay, separation pay for employees terminated on the ground of retrenchment, redundancy, closure, or illness, and the right to reinstatement with back wages for those illegally dismissed. Aliens who are not employees cannot organize a labor organization. This is because Article 284 of the Labor Code of the Philippines prohibits them from engaging in all forms of trade union activities. Trade union activities refer to organization and administration of labor organizations, negotiation and administration of CBAs, concerted union actions, organizing, managing, or assisting union conventions, meetings, rallies, referenda, teach-ins, seminars, conferences, and institutes, participation or involvement in representation proceedings, representation elections, consent elections, union elections, and other analogous activities. The disqualification of the above-mentioned employees is not unconstitutional. It does not violate the constitutional right to self-organization because the disqualification is only about organizing or joining a labor organization, that is, for collective bargaining purposes. It does not prohibit them from forming or joining an association for their mutual aid and protection. Even though government employees and employees of GOCCs are not allowed to form or join a labor organization, they can form or join associations for purposes not contrary to law. But remember, the right accorded to government employees to form or join associations is not available to number 1. Members of the Armed Forces of the Philippines number 2. Members of the Philippine National Police number 3. Members of the Bureau of Fire Protection number 4. Members of the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology number 5. High-level employees whose functions are normally considered as policy-making or managerial, and number six, employees whose duties are of highly confidential nature. When does an employee qualify for union membership? This is on the first day of his employment. What are the implications of the right to self-organization? The right of employees to self-organization carries with it the right to 1. 
abstain from joining a union, two, choose which union he would join, and three, cancel his membership with the union. Is the right to abstain, choose, or resign from the union an absolute rule? The answer is no. The right to abstain from joining a union, as well as the right to resign from the union or to choose which union to join, cannot be exercised where the contracting union, that is, the certified bargaining agent, and the employer have agreed on a union security arrangement. What is a union security agreement? A union security agreement is a stipulation in the collective bargaining agreement which requires employees covered by the collective bargaining unit to become members of the contracting union and to maintain their union membership in good standing as a condition for continued employment. Take note that a collective bargaining unit is different from a union. A union or labor organization is a group of employees organized for collective bargaining. On the other hand, a bargaining unit is a group of employees within the employer unit who share mutual interests in wages, hours of work, working conditions, and other subjects of collective bargaining. The union, who will be certified as bargaining agent, will represent the employees covered by the bargaining unit, whether they are union members or not. It is possible that two or more unions may exist in a bargaining unit. For instance, two or more unions may exist in the bargaining unit of rank-and-file employees. As to which union will represent the bargaining unit will be settled through a certification election. The union that wins in the election will be certified as the bargaining agent of the bargaining unit of rank-and-file employees. Note the types of union security agreements. Closed shop, union shop, maintenance of membership, preferential shop, and agency shop. Number one, closed shop. Closed shop is an agreement whereby the employer binds himself to hire only members of the contracting union who must continue to remain members in good standing to keep their jobs. Number two, preferential shop. Preferential shop is an arrangement whereby the members of the contracting union are given preference in engagement, all circumstances being equal and for them to maintain their membership in good standing during the lifetime of the collective bargaining agreement as a condition of continued employment. Number three, union shop. Union shop is an agreement whereby the employer can hire non-members of the contracting union on the condition that they should join the union within a specified period and must continue to remain members in good standing to keep their jobs. Number four, maintenance of membership. Maintenance of membership is an agreement which requires those who are members of the contracting union at the time of the execution of the collective bargaining agreement to maintain their membership in good standing as a condition of continued employment. Number five, agency shop. Agency shop is an agreement which does not require union membership but only support in the form of agency fees from the employees which are covered by the bargaining unit. Note the distinction between agency fees vis-a-vis -vis union dues. Agency fees are assessments made by the union against non-union members covered by the bargaining unit who accept the benefits under the CBA. On the other hand, union dues are assessments made by the union against union members. If there is a closed shop or union shop agreement in a certain establishment, is it possible for the contracting union, that is the bargaining agent, to assess agency fees? Yes, it is possible for the contracting union, that is the bargaining agent, to assess agency fees from employees. It will be noted that agency fees are assessed against non-union members covered by the bargaining unit who accept the benefits under the collective bargaining agreement. Even though a closed shop or union shop requires all employees covered by the bargaining unit to join the union, there may be some employees who would opt not to join the contracting union because they are members of another union at the time of the signing of the CBA or because they are members of a religious sect which prohibits its members from joining a union. In such a situation, the bargaining agent can validly assess agency fees from said employees if they accept the benefits under the collective bargaining agreement. Are union security agreements valid? Union security agreements are valid and legal. Article 259 of the Labor Code of the Philippines states that nothing in this code or in any other law shall stop the parties from requiring membership in a recognized collective bargaining agent as a condition for employment. What is the effect of a union security agreement? If there is a union security agreement, the employee must join the contracting union and or maintain 
his membership in good standing to retain his employment. He can resign from the union only during the freedom period, that is, within the 60-day period prior to the expiration of the collective bargaining agreement. If the union member fails to maintain his membership in good standing or resigns prior to the freedom period, he will be subject to dismissal. Employees can be dismissed for breach of union security agreement even if they may not be aware of such a provision. But the authority to dismiss must be expressly stipulated. An employer is bound to dismiss an employee under a union security agreement only when the authority to dismiss is clearly expressed in the agreement. Furthermore, due process must be observed. If a union member refuses to join the union or fails to maintain his union membership in good standing, the union will recommend to the employer his dismissal from employment. But before effecting the dismissal, the employer must observe due process, which means that the employer should first require the employee to explain, conduct administrative hearing if necessary, and proceed to dismiss the union member only when warranted by the evidence. What is the sanction for the employee's failure to observe due process? If the dismissal is found to be valid and justified, but the employer failed to observe due process, then the employer and the union will be solidarily liable for nominal damages. Note the facts to be proved. If the employer is sued for illegal dismissal for terminating an employee for breach of the union security agreement, the employer should prove that number one, the union security clause is applicable, number two, the union requested the employer to enforce the union security agreement, and number three, there is sufficient evidence to support the union's decision to expel the employee from the union. Note the limitations on the applicability of union security agreements. Number one, Union security agreements cannot be enforced against employees who are already members of another union at the time of the signing of the collective bargaining agreement. Number two, union security agreements cannot be enforced against employees who were unjustifiably refused admission by the union itself. And number three, union security agreements cannot be enforced against employees who are members of religious sects which prohibit the members from joining a labor organization. The reason is that the free exercise of religious belief is superior to contract rights. What is the effect of a union security agreement in case of merger? Union security agreements apply to employees who were absorbed because of merger of corporations. Otherwise, it will lead to an inequitable and very volatile labor situation. What is the importance of the right to self-organization? The law attaches great importance to the right of employees to self-organization that it declares as unlawful or criminal for any person to restrain, coerce, discriminate against, or duly interfere with employees and workers in the exercise of the right to self-organization. However, the right to self-organization should be subordinated to the constitutional provision protecting the sanctity of contracts. Thus, if there is a union security agreement, such as a closed shop, a union member cannot just resign from the union without sacrificing his employment. To allow him to keep his employment would in effect nullify the closed shop agreement, thereby destroying its sanctity. To allow him to keep his employment would in effect nullify the closed shop agreement, thereby destroying its sanctity. The right to self-organization yields to the proviso in Article 259E of the Labor Code of the Philippines, which states that nothing in this code or in any other law shall stop the parties from requiring membership in a recognized collective bargaining agent as a condition for employment, except those employees who are already members of another union at the time of the signing of the collective bargaining agreement. Remember that the right to engage in concerted activities, which is an incident of the right to self-organization, is not likewise absolute.